it can come across as arrogance, but I think it's so important that you have a clear position to say, I have something of value to offer you. Hello and welcome to the Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard, and today I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Andy Bigwood, a partner at Ridge and Partners. He has a profound focus on leading and facilitating client and design team collaborations. Andy is dedicated to uncovering, designing, and delivering quality projects that make a positive difference to the spaces where we live, work, and learn. Previously, Andy worked at Fosters and Partners, uh, where he was an associate partner, and he was also the head of contracts and business development at Heatherwick Studio for about four years. He originally trained in mechanical engineering, and he migrated into working with architecture practices, where he developed a specialism around contract negotiations, client acquisition, and the mechanisms needed to elevate a practice into profit and growth. With a wealth of experience in business development and design leadership, Andy imparts invaluable tips and insights to help architects and design professionals win more work and grow their businesses to reach their potential. This episode is filled with golden gems, so make sure that you listen to it more than once. We talk about the secrets behind how signature brand firms like Norman Foster, Foster and Partners, and Heatherwick negotiate contracts and win work. We look at the risks that all architecture practices face with new clients and the temptation of doing free work and competitions and the risks that are involved. And we also look at what the large practices do to get paid on time and the challenges that they face. So lots of really interesting, deep insights into the world of larger architecture practice firms here. Sit back, relax and enjoy Andy Bigwood. It's time to announce this month's 200 Club. If you missed our episode on the 200 Club, listen to Business of Architecture episode 485 to learn more about this new initiative for benchmarking small firm performance. So a big congratulations to Drew and Justine Tyndall, Kimberly Dokes, Daniela Aspana and Nguyen Ranasing, Mark Elster, Charles Scram, Irini Adams, Chris Brandon, Brad Hubble, Marina Rubina, Yogesh Mystery, Andrea Nemechek, Denise Burke and Yos Bende, Chris Rawlings, Jorge Catran, Lina Bola, Judy and Larry Apel, Kelly Morgan, David and Kristen Ware, and George Aguirre. Great job to everyone who's made it into the 200 Club this month. Keep up the fantastic work. This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello, listeners. We hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. Hello, Andy. Welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? Very good. Hello, Ryan. Very Excellent. Good. good. Good to be speaking with you. Now, you've had a very interesting career. You were previously a associate partner at Foster's and partner. Um, and more recently, you are one of the partners at Ridgen Partners um, and have developed a very interesting career specialism, um, practice strategy, development, design management, um, and actually very active in, in um, client acquisition and helping and making sure that the business is actually winning work. So perhaps we can, we can talk a little bit about um, um, Ridgen Partners and your, your current role there and and how you got to to be in the position that you're in sure no it's great to talk talk to you more and um so i i've been at ridge and partners for about almost so a year and a half now mm -hmm. just over that i think so um i joined after spending some time at fosters where i was there for two years previous to that i did actually spend about five years at heatherwick studio as well heading up there head of business development and and the commercial team 
and previous to that was about eight years at Foster's. So over 20 years in um, this area of architecture with some quite signature practices, clearly. Um, the interesting thing at Ridge was it was a, the Ridge itself is now just in the AJ um, 100 this year has got to mm. position 38. Last year was at 62. So it's been getting up the, up the rankings. And um, that's been fascinating just to see how that progress has happened in the last year. Rich has got over 1,100 people. It's a multidisciplinary practice. Mm -hmm. So with pro project managers, engineers, architects, and that in itself was an interesting, rather than a solely architecture focused practice. Um, and I came across to Ridge. I'm based in London. Um, someone I worked with at Foster's mm -hmm. came across, across and there was an opportunity to build a, a London team. And um, there's a wider team of architects across the practice, which is 130 now. So it's a big practice of architects as well as the multidisciplinary. And, and the, the real challenge and the interesting bit for me was growing a, a London team, focusing on design, focusing on really high quality work and gaining all the nuggets and information from previous practices like Foster's and Heatherwick and, and also um, having it as arguably a non-signature practice and what the different challenges are there and mm -hmm. differences compared to a highly branded, you know, something like a Foster's, which is very well known over the last 50 years, 45 sure. years, and, and has built that, that profile. So, yeah. So, so very interesting in your, your background, obviously, you're not a architect in the traditional sense, um, that you've worked intimately in architecture practices for the majority of your career. You've got a degree in, is it mechanical engineering? That's correct. And, yes. and real estate and <laughs> finance as well, or economics. That's right. Yeah. And that was a, not a degree. It was a short course at LSE. Right. And, um, yeah. But yeah, just trying to get awareness about it. Gotcha, Same gotcha. Thing. Okay. And so so the position that you've been doing in Foster's Partners, Heather Wicks, um, can, you, can you talk a little bit about what you were helping these practices do? What sure. was you? How would you describe what your role was? So very much, largely at Foster's, it was a project management role. So, and focusing on business development, commercial and contract negotiation and also setting the projects up. So a lot of focus at the front end, winning the work, or well, negotiating and also building the right team for the specific opportunity and making sure that the, the project was set up as best it could be to deliver and protect the architecture teams, but also engineering teams, because it was often a multidisciplinary offer. Now, whether that was leading by Foster's with a sub-consultant of a big engineering firm like WSP, for example. Mm -hmm. So it's making sure the, yeah, the different facets of the, the business side in terms of fees, contracts, um, terms and programs, and the delivery was set up in the best possible way so the, so the architect team was protected. Um, and also once the contract was signed, leading into design management, so leading and working with the client teams on and the architect teams to make sure there was enough, um, well, the whole, the whole project was set up properly and there was the right degree of client decision-making. If there was issues, sorting out additional fees, sorting out changes of briefs, things like that, which I think what's interesting, it does span and scale, you know, from mm -hmm. the smallest practice to the largest practice. It's the same formula of tools and mm -hmm. systems to protect, to protect the firm. There's obviously different, people involved different stakeholders different um locations i think that was a fascinating thing at foster's and heatherwick they were you were dealing, dealing with all sorts of cultures globally so it was um could be japan could, could be over in um, tokyo one one day and then the next day it was google in mountain view so there's a whole breadth of clients but i think distilling it down there's the same tools to get through to get a safe contract sorted out Mm -hmm. with the right fee, fee levels and also making sure you've got the right protections in place. What, but what also sort, just, you, yeah, yeah, sorry. I was, I was going to say, what, what sorts of things are you, are you doing to ensure the safety of a contract? What kinds of mistakes would be kind of very serious for these practices to, uh, to make? And, and also, how do you make sure that the fees are 
correct. We kind of assume with the with the mm. with, with practices like Heather Wicks or Foster's that you know, like you're saying, their signature name practices. One would expect the clients are kind of approaching them, and that they're able to charge a kind of premium on their fees comparatively to other practices. I don't know whether that's the truth, but that's what what the the outside perspective is often. I think it depends on the situation and the market yeah. and um and uh, and uh, it does vary. I think it's fair to say there's um you you definitely have a stronger hand if you've got a strong brand and the client mm-hmm. wants to work with you. But there's you know most of these large scale signature sort of big cultural projects are won through competitions and um often there's you, you have to put a lot of skin in the game to start off with which I think is one of the things I'm fascinated by how that's set up and architects do get a raw deal often at the start when they have to do a lot of free work they have to put which is easier for people with deeper pockets like these more successful firms which is harder mm-hmm. for smaller firms clearly who don't have that and don't have mm-hmm. but it so i think and the more and more you see these firms do have if you're in a competition situation the terms of procurement are set out from the start and they're quite difficult you just have to maybe have a bigger war chest in a sense to up, put some money in to invest in these competitions. But then behind the scenes, you can talk to people and try and build different streams of reputation in the area, in, in what, the geography to help. But also I think, I think Foster's have done it very well over the years in terms of building um, a sort of reputation in terms of they can deliver, they will mm-hmm. deliver. And they they will take on sort of ambitious projects and give the com- there's a whole back catalogue of obviously case studies to show they have can do that so it puts you in a very strong position. I think in terms of you know the detail in terms of terms and conditions, I think fundamentally you're trying to secure payment and make sure you you do get the best payment terms possible. Now whether that's an upfront advance payment. Now as I say in a competition situation, you can't always do that. You have to just try and win the competition but in other direct appointments or when you're in a more competitive situation in terms of you're not doing a design competition but submitting a proposal Mm -hmm. uh, or a request for proposal you can then often dictate your terms and and come to a middle ground and i think it's just about being reasonable and talking to the client about explaining really carefully your your team your resources you'll have to expend how you work and obviously why should you work for free? And I think that's the crazy thing in the industry, which seems to be often in those early stages, it's just given it's completely reasonable for an architect to work for free, which is, you know, if you went to a lawyer or went to an accountant, went to any other professional service provider, they'd be like, what are you talking about? You know, and you, you know, I think architects generally, we can, we can help in terms of putting forward the case to say, well, that's not reasonable. And I always mm-hmm. try and get to that position of, and I, and I think it comes back to also building a really strong relationship with the client and the client's team and, and mapping out who the key decision makers are, who the, you know, not roadblocks, but who the people you have to get in front of and what their process is. So I think even before putting a proposal on it, sort of backing up and just thinking, well, okay, what's the process of client mm-hmm. sign off? Because often you do find you get through maybe one proposal situation and then you get to the next round and then, the fees get negotiated and negotiated and negotiated. So I think in those upfront conversations, just having a really honest conversation and open conversation about what process is can help a lot and not assume anything. Mm-hmm. And obviously be, and I think I was trying to list out some of the traits of where I think people are successful versus not successful. I think having this self-confidence and belief you know, it can come across as arrogance, but I think it's so important that you have a clear position to say, I have something of value to offer you, whichever size scale type of firm you are. And this is, and really have make it clear why that is. Mm-hmm. And there's different techniques I think you can apply to different sectors, for example. But I think I see that in the, the, the larger teams, even from an early stage, I think, I think Norman Foster was very confident and a very clear communicator to explain this is, the value add I offer mm-hmm. and this is and it clearly showed it afterwards quite quickly and there's some amazing 
and thinking back to some of the examples in the early days when it they didn't have the brand they still showed and almost over delivered the um on what they could offer from and it also surprised the client i think there's if you can get in a situation where you're face to face to the client having those one on one conversations it might be you've built that relationship before they even were going through a formal you know commercial proposal or tender process procurement process and you've built a relationship up before and i see that day in day out now very the successful architects do that they're pre-positioning they're building relationships with these key clients they're targeting and building that and it may involve a little bit of free work mm -hmm. but it leads on to saying okay i've tr i've shown you i can deliver for you i've shown you i can solve your problems and um then it's not a conversation about well why should i choose you over that that firm i know you're delivering for me i know and then when you overlay that over time with good experience with delivered projects and mm -hmm. a back catalog of great you know building that portfolio is obviously super important how, how, that you, yeah how, how how do you qualify uh, a client I'm, I'm i recall conversations when i was at rshp um you know, the suspicion sometimes of a certain client where they've just approached a big name practice and, you know, it could be quite exciting and intoxicating on at first, you know, some big project in some exotic location. But then there was always sometimes, hold on a minute, is this a project that's actually going to take off? They're asking us to, you know, are we going to do free work for this person? How do we know that they're legit? How do you, how do you qualify? A client to make sure that they're who and what they say they are because e even at the the larger commercial scales it's sure. still you know you know sometimes we we, we kind of come across this in uh, smaller smaller projects but even at larger commercial scales there's still a there's still things which aren't appear what they are no, and also that, and also competitions as well definitely no i think and that's that's the challenges i think you've almost got to you can ask some very careful questions at the start. I think always building the open questions and having a script to pre-determine questions to try and analyze what the what the project type is, you know, almost what it is, who the authority is, trying to ask the questions about that process, trying to ask understand about their funding structures. And not to say it's a problem, but just have an open conversation. I think you can be, if they're professional and you're professional, you can get that captured. If you can't, if you're having problems trying to understand that, there's some alarm bells should be ringing but equally there's no harm in saying no to opportunities and i think you know that's probably is the biggest strength some of these it's, it's a it's a tricky balance when you've got large teams and this sort of this is where you get into a challenge of bigger and bigger companies where you've got mouths to feed and almost the sort of go no go decision sometimes reduces down because you you just need to get work in mm -hmm. so I think the the lens is different, but at my at our, at my experience of when it goes well, you should really focus on it's all, it's about the client, but it's also about you. Do you really want to work on these projects? And and think carefully about why. I like to talk about you know maybe the head of the company, their decision to do it, but then also the partner in charge. Are they invest? Would they love to do this project or not? And have two keys to turn rather than just one founder saying yeah we're doing all these projects throwing it over the fence and then it just carries on in terms of and then you get a disgruntled team because you're constantly doing work you're not necessarily invested in and you want to mm -hmm. do and that and that happens i think with scale as well and i think on the smaller practices you've got more opportunity probably to develop that personal go no go question about is this the portfolio i want to be building does this project fit in it properly now that's a slightly different thing, but I think we do have more control than we think about taking on the projects we want to, and arguably mm -hmm. can have more success once you determine your own portfolio, which again can scale from an individual architect up to big architectural teams, but mm -hmm. and um, largely focused on sector. But I think you're completely right in terms of some of the bigger, higher profile conversations are more difficult in terms of checking if that client has the money at the right time to pay you. And, and fundamentally, it does. You need to do some tests like that. Maybe you can limit your risk by saying, "Would you start?" You know, the I see more and more. There's a lot of firms who will 
do an individual stage, do sort of a pre, I suppose, before you even get into concept design, a short piece of work, working out is the brief right. And that can be quite an um, agile way of starting a project where you're lower, lowering your risk because you can often secure that quite quickly. The client can sign it off quickly. You, you can really test if they're serious or not. You can see, oh, do you want to keep working with them? And I think that is something we can port you know, position carefully with clients and, and negotiate quickly. You mm -hmm. can, maybe don't get that much fees then, but that's fine because you're really trying to build the relationship with them, let them build a relationship with you and have that equal relationship. And then during that time, you can secure a work because often sometimes these bigger projects are quite complex to work out. So durations, you know, the actual stakeholder sign-off process, the planning process, the, you know, what sort of sustainability targets are you going to focus on? And there's a lot of education in those early stages, I think, and educating the client. So, but ultimately the test is really, the acid test is, you know, clearly do they pay you and do they pay you on time? And that's fundamental. And I think, you know, not assuming they're going to pay you and then positioning it, not being afraid to say, well, I want to get paid up front, paid in monthly amounts. And then obviously maybe it needs to be a success fee if there's certain things which are restricted on their the client's funding mm -hmm. uh, release it releases but uh, but i see i do see it at the top highest level you get challenges with payments at the you know not the lowest level but the e any scale can be difficult so i think the, the more you sort of look at this is like just having really clear and open communication and saying well not being afraid to say this is why we need this payment plan and and often you do get into resourcing requirements and, and once clients understand that, I think there's there's clarity, but you're trying to de-risk this a lot of the time for um the client who doesn't always know, you know, that he's coming often to you as the expert in or the team of experts delivering this quite technical, risky service. Mm -hmm. And I think I think that's a fascinating thing when you're always putting yourself in the client's sort of chair and thinking about well what's he up against how can you make him look good and that individual and then the client look good and it and often if there is a problem with their funding they might you know often can happen with developers so you have an honest and open conversation about that and just say right well, you, you need to pay us but you know let's work out a proper payment plan and then so limiting your risks on you know testing if they're serious or not yeah but i think as soon as you go down the line and it clearly happens with developers a lot we're not we're not going to pay you until you get planning or we'll, you know we'll pay you on a, a success fee structure which is all risk on the architect team which is clearly quite quite challenging but it may be worth it for the right opportunity and i i think that's where well that's you that's about where it's yeah, at, don't you yeah you know? that, that's that's where it becomes interesting because obviously you know getting paid on a success fee for you know we have a lot of um clients at, at a business of architecture where you know it doesn't work if the developer is suddenly imposing this time frame on you and you hadn't agreed it up front but if there's a negotiation up front where an architect says okay i'll take the risk of getting you know paid after planning approvals but in order for me to take that risk then there's got to be a healthy bonus or uplift in my fees as a result okay great well then now you now the architect can choose to share in the risk and get rewarded for it as opposed to just you know being forced mm. to take on risk um you know you you make an agreement for a certain amount of fees and then what's your what's your reward um for taking on risk is well you get paid what you said you, you agreed on but it's just six months late um and and, and that doesn't completely. work completely and uh, yeah no completely and i think again having that open and conversation and being curious about how that client or their whoever's running the funding model mm -hmm. in a development situation how that's going to work and um yeah trying to get an equal balance of risk and return um i think that's it's one of the games isn't it of this i think trying to for me i look at it let's try it as a bit of a puzzle let's work out how you mm -hmm. can get the best de deal for you and them and then uh there's a way forward potentially, but you do have to say no sometimes and say this isn't going to work out and well, move on quick, quickly. And that's probably in that low like, said design in the go, no go situation saying no is more important than saying yes, actually. And knowing when you do say no, and when the red lines are. What, what, it, what kinds of questions yeah. would you be asking, let's say a developer client 
um, about their funding model and what sorts of answers would be giving, what sorts of things, what questions would you be asking and what kinds of things would you be looking out for that could be potential red, red flags that might mean payment might be hindered or, you know, you might be taking on a bit more risk than you anticipated? Yeah, I think it's it's an interesting question. And I think often the big milestones are the developers when you get to planning. Clearly, that's when it de-risks massively. And, and quite often developers at that point, these early stage developers will get their money out or most of their money out at that point and maybe right. open out to wider investment pools. So understanding if that's their exit strategy or if they, and then there's obviously probably a, they'll stay involved until the, um, point of construction delivery and then that might be when they get all their money out so it's maybe for them a, 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 a you know a timeline of maybe four years but a lot of the risk is reduced at the point when you get planning so but clearly that could take a while for a big development if you're working for say three four five months to get up to planning maybe and then there's a window until planning success is occurred mm -hmm. you know when it's determined that could take another period of maybe six months so it's that could be a year of working at quite challenging rates. But again, if you, so yeah, we shouldn't go in lightly. We should really just think of, about those risks and then be realistic about it. Is it right for us? Do we have, can mm -hmm. we support that process if you don't get planning, you know, and what happens then and think about the worst case scenario. But then if there's an upside, so often it's, let's cover the, maybe the cost of the team, still try and get, secure that and try and be realistic. And this is where I think having external planning consultants can be really useful mm -hmm. to map out in that location. what. So it's an independent sort of verification of the program. It's not the client's best case, we're going to get planning in six months, or it's not yours saying, well, I need all this time to do the design. It's a sort of independent, and then you be realistic. But the upside to the developer is clearly a lot more often than the architect and once they get that value you know they could sell it after planning and then i think those are the questions which are quite important like is and they may not tell you so but you can look from their previous do their research behind the scenes what do they typically do to their developments do they hold it and some will but often i think in those early stages at once they get planning or once they get um a bit later on they will bring in pension fund um, investors or bigger scale investors who will be there for the longer term and mm -hmm. that'll be their investment um, timeline and i think it's not a problem if that current developer wants to get out i suppose it's just making sure once you understand that and you've mapped it through make sure then you you can it works for you financially and it's a uh, and even as i say the worst case scenario if if it goes if you don't get planning are you okay with that situation? And you might have, you be able to offset it against other opportunities you're working on. Uh, and, I, so and, I guess, and I guess, and I guess, in <clears throat> in some cases, there might be, a, you know, a change of client, even or like if a developer was selling it post planning to another developer who's going to take on the actual construction of the build, then d does the architect then want to kind of negotiate? Um, some kind of clause in a contract to make sure that they get retained on for the the project. Do you ever see that kind of situation coming you can, up? Or? You can, again, it sort of depends. And this is where I think people with very strong brand signature firms are in, have more strength there. Mm -hmm. Because then you can say they want a X design building and it, it, you almost, you can stay involved. I think if you can try and you can obviously keep, have some wording in there but it's normally it it can happen but i think if that is one of the challenges to go in with open eyes i think they can still terminate a contract quite and and go to someone else mm -hmm. i think another pressure which is coming recently is um the rise of designer build contracts and clients going to contractors earlier you know and at that point in the uk you have obviously sort of stage normally after stage three potentially could go to a designer build contract one and um the designer build contractor doesn't want the architect involved and goes to their own preferred architect to mm -hmm. deliver the service so then you could get cut out then if you're not careful and i think it is it's, a, it's an interesting one i mean i think as ever you've got to prove your value all the way through mm -hmm. and if you you're offering great value you're offering solving problems even in those later stages for contractors i think you can you can win and you can 
you can you can keep going but it's it's certainly a risk and i think um it happens internationally as well as in the uk you know they'll buy the name especially well maybe it's more common in the far east how you protect yourself maybe you just ch- upfront the fees and really charge more in those early stages and then if you do get cut out it's not such a big risk mm-hmm. you know you've you've made more money to count to counter that so you could keep the team going but um it's certainly a challenge it's, i think we've got to acknowledge it, it's difficult you know building stuff and getting paid is difficult anyway and then if it's a really exceptional project it's arguably more difficult and the full testament to people who can keep going and keep going with these you know if it's a, your own design practice or your work within a bigger practice it's it is difficult and i think this is where i'm, I'm fascinated with the sort of you've just got to have that relent, relentless resilience and be able to keep going and from a mental health point of view it's 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 hard and i think building a team around you who can really support you is fundamental mm-hmm. really being careful about you know the balance of i sort of look at it you know financially you might be making are you making enough money for your practice that's difficult then there's also have you got the right work life balance that's challenging for architecture especially and you should you know working all hours you might be making loads of money in projects in the middle east but have you got a home life balance? Are you seeing your kids? Are you seeing your family? It's a challenge and attention. And then the third area, are you actually doing projects which are meaningful to you? And at the end of your life, will you look back and think, oh, I'm so proud of that portfolio. So I think there's it's interesting to get sucked along with just making money for the practice. And then after mm-hmm. 10 years, maybe you think, well, was that worth it? You know, all that pain and whatever, divorces or, you know, not seeing my kids as they're growing up. And so I think for me, it's, you want to have that well-rounded situation. Um, it's a bit of a wider concept, but more and more it's becoming, because I've got a young daughter who's now 10, and you think, well, so those moments you could miss yeah. by working all hours is not really what life's about. Clearly you want to, um, you want to have a full and an interesting work, but it should be balanced with your home life. Mm-hmm. And then, like I say, this meaningful portfolio conversation, it's not easy, but actually I think if you deeply think about what projects I want to make a difference to, you know, what pro- not just chasing after the money. I think that doesn't necessarily, it works for some people, mm-hmm. but I think in, especially in this wider societal challenge where we've got <laughs> climate change, bless you. Thank you. <laughs> where we've got um, societal challenges of climate change, you know, the extreme differences between rich and poor and, you know, some of the big structural societal ch- challenges we've got, how we address those. Mm-hmm. Plus, you know, there's, there's the underline of just developing projects and doing great design work. But in the realms of this whole thing, we should be using less materials or being more careful with what we're designing. It sort of really focuses your mind on what is the right portfolio portfolio of projects moving forward. Mm-hmm. And I think having having time to actually think about that and really then trying to watch your your personal health about not burning out because it and then building a, a team to share the responsibilities is so important and then you might survive for a few years but actually you you, you need to have that great team around you for mm-hmm. longevity and to keep smashing you know and delivering and doing all the great stuff which you can and i think after a while burnout becomes you know if you're not careful it just happens and so sad whereas if maybe if you can set up the practice at the start to really you know look after yourself and you know we're all gonna we're not gonna win every job we go for so then it's like how do we process mentally you know not feel too bad about not winning but thinking about all the benefits there and obviously did we put every effort we could have done on that situation in time to secure that project if we did we learn something along the way did we improve along the way you know those sorts of situations and looking at the effort was 100 percent or more mm-hmm. we didn't we didn't win but there's factors why we didn't win so we can take on board for the next and almost like training hard and going again and not being mentally getting too tied up with oh we failed again we didn't win we didn't win clearly there was because i think what's interesting is if you keep positive in a relationship with that situation those clients you built up quite often they will come back to you for the next one or the next opportunity they have. And you've already, it's not the end mm-hmm. or you've le- learned so much about their problems through that process 
you can then pivot and apply it to another situation yeah, with a similar of, typology. Of it, it, it's so, nice. Uh, starts uh, to compound. I think so. I mean, it's just that's I'm not sure. I think I lost the question there, but the uh, the the general sort of idea of trying to be, look after yourself as and then look after your team, I think, is another area which mm-hmm. in architecture, especially in the last twenty years. I don't think it's necessarily been given enough focus and actually the whole situation where, you know, architects have been paid, you know, a salary and then, but the expectation or the demands require overtime working is just, you know, and it becomes a culture then and almost a bravado to keep going the latest. Yeah. I think uh, you can get a better balance in life, um, which is some thoughts I've got recently. No, abs- absolutely. Yeah. And, and, you know, the kind of negotiating of the fees and the contract and being very selective with, with who it is that you're, you're working for and, you know, making sure that you're able to tick the, 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 all the, the work life balance parts of it, as well as being able to, you know, ensure that you're getting decent fees from the work as well. So you can sustain yourself in a healthy manner and, and not be, kind of killing yourself doing something for low fees or killing yourself doing something for high fees where there's no substance to the project or you're doing things which are diminishing your own your own values because none of that is all of that like you say is going to end up just causing mental health problems stress overwhelm and and burnout i i, I wanted to talk a little bit about um kind of competitions and the risk of competitions mm-hmm. um I've seen on the inside, I've been part of like many, many competition entries in my career when I was working, again, when I was working at RSHP, um, they had like a a constant competition team that was on rotation. Mm -hmm. I assume Fosters and Heatherwick have the same kind of structure where they've, they've Mm -hmm. got, they've got deep pockets. They, they have the ability to be able to enter lots and lots of competitions and they only need to win one or two of them a year for it to kind of pay for all of the work that they're doing in other competitions um what sorts of for you what what kinds of risks do competitions pose and how do you make sure that the competition that you're you're engaging in is going to be a it's legit b that it's you know is there some sort of strategy that you've got in place if you don't win, i.e., you know, that it's going to give you some exposure or there's, there's some marketing collateral that's produced. Um, and, and, and yeah, and I think kind of see how do you mitigate, certainly as, you know, with smaller practices, how do you kind of mitigate the amount that you input into it? Cause it's very easy to kind of get into a culture of just throw everything at a competition. You know, we saw the, I think the Guggenheim in Helsinki project was pretty disturbing in terms of the amount of resource that it produced from, you know, a thousand or so practices, many of these small practices. And then we have Asif Khan winning it and, you know, doing extraordinary work, taking it through to that second stage only for the project to just to suddenly disappear. And there's an enormous amount of investment there from, from a young, from a young practice and for the project just didn't have any you know it, it it was it was very precarious in the first place there's an enormous amount of risk for architects um when they're entering in into competitions how how do you how do you see kind of what sorts of alarm bells would there be for you yeah. in, in in terms of which competitions to enter and which ones to stay away from no it makes sense i if you can avoid them on total i think that'd be great and if you can have direct conversations clearly about even how build your, and it's clearly there are benefits. And I, mm-hmm. I do debate this with various people about this quite a lot. And it's, uh, it, you also, like you say, weighing up the, is it for portfolio building? Even if you don't win, what does it give you? Does it get you onto a new stage in front of a new group of clients? Is it the only way to break into that sector or that client base? Um, and it could well be a launch to a new platform of project. So I think having a solid financial um, pipeline is important as well. And mm-hmm. even, I think, I think Hostel and Heverick wouldn't go for every single competition. It was very selective. It was very carefully thought through. And often it was like, do we have a genuine chance in winning this? Is there something 
have we had you know very often the clients will come to various firms and talk to them about you know and invite them so is it an invited competition and weigh up the numbers you see like those examples or there was one i saw in cambridge for the civic center the other day or earlier last year which we turned down which had something like 120 people going to the site visit and it's like okay there's 120 people there must be you know the element of just risk, you know, or probability is you're not going to get selected because it's not worth it. There's one for the British Museum out at the moment, which again, and there's an interiors at the V&A, which all amazing projects, but you do have to sort of think, well, there's loads of great design firms out there. Honestly, do we have a way in? Why are we different? And I think yeah. being what was quite nice, actually, if you can get a room together of critical people who haven't got a vested interest in that specific project where maybe it's their hometown or it's their they were dying so they're gradually to do that project having mm-hmm. some different lenses like um reputationally some of the comms team for example uh financed for some of them the what are our fine studio finances like can we afford to do this competition you could maybe budget in the start of the year for the number of you know, because there will be some probably, and then weigh up with the other design partners. Is this the right opportunity for us versus their one? You know, there may be a bit of a horse trade in terms of who's right in the situation and be just objective and business development and contracts can look at it from the lens of what are the risks? Are we going to gain from it from a yeah commercial fee point of view? Is it really worth the investment at the start? Some of them aren't, as you say, and they can stop like any project can stop clearly, but competitions, especially public, big ones, it almost, for me, sometimes I'm quite cynical about it. It always mm-hmm. seems like it's a, it's a big fashion show in a sense to show off a good competition. And it's actually arguably the competition organizers who are winning best out of this because they're, they get promoted. So yeah, much. it's, it's a, and, it's a marketing yeah, event. You know. It seems like it. And, and I think procurement itself could be done. Definitely. So I think probably stepping back from, we can't always change how that happens and it, it's avoiding doing them in the first place by building, for example, why do you, and asking those tough questions, what are you trying to get out of it? Is there a place where there's not everyone, the herd is not flocking to that area or herding to that area? Is it, is there areas, say, if you're working in higher ed- education or if it's some other, maybe big cultural projects, there is, um, everyone wants to do big museums say maybe there's other projects which you get more satisfaction out of and they're less busy mm-hmm. I think in um and maybe go to build a reputation in those sectors i think for like heavyweight even fosters in the early days they didn't chase after those types of projects they were fosters especially were quite industrial they were stuff which other people weren't doing yeah the big, you know and, and actually they forged this whole new lens of architecture and i think i think that's what's quite interesting is when we break down out of all of the built environment how much are actually you know designed by architects there's quite a lot which aren't and um you can probably make a lot more headway in doing small changes to large you know large sheds keep popping up all over the uk and you're like some of them are soulless industrial states you know surely that would be a lot more you know enjoyable to try and make a small difference to that space compared to a, a luxury art museum where you think, well, okay, that's, it's nice, but is that really where I want to be working? Similarly with, um, yeah, so um, the different sectors, I think where where are the gaps is probably mm-hmm. a big place to look and, and not go to where everyone else is going. And actually you can have much more exciting conversations with people in those situations because there aren't these organized competitions. That's, that's, um, really, that's a really interesting yeah. point that you bring up. Yeah, obviously Fosters were... You know, and, and same with RSHP and Grimshaw, you know, and Hopkins, yeah. they, were, they, they were doing these sort of unusual industrial buildings that other architects weren't interested in. Um, Completely. And, and, and that's where they were using their kind of, you know, uh, using it as an area to, to experiment and were building out a, a reputation. That's a very interesting um, 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 thought there. Well, I, think so. I think so. And some of the, yeah, touching on how you make those spaces more, mm human friendly people centric doesn't have to be ever, the whole site either i mean that's what's interesting you could have large production spaces but maybe there's some more people focused areas um 
But I, but I suppose it also comes back to why, what are you doing it for as well? Why are you bidding for those competitions? And actually, it, I find personally it's much more enjoyable actually building relationships and networking and growing mm-hmm. relationships in other events, where it depends what you're focusing in on. But there's there's so many problems which people need help with. Um, like I say, in, at this stage, higher education is going through lots of challenges. There's some big university campuses which are doing amazing work, but they've got challenges with occupancy, student numbers going down, um, space. They've got too many buildings. They need to consolidate. They need to think about new ways of learning and teaching with the home working. There's sort of sector specific focus, and there's there's loads loads of opportunities, and there's a really healthy community of people where they. They're wanting to make positive change in terms of sustainability, lowering energy usage, you know, making big changes. I think you can carve, be more proactive and go out and meet people and actually have that in mind. Equally, obviously, um, let's say transportation or ports, areas where ports are are really challenging at the moment. They're not, they're very typically industrial. They don't have to be. Some of the best projects can be, you know, in Sydney Opera House, walking down you know, to the marina, there's some lovely spaces. Everyone likes waterfront places. So, mm-hmm. but I think often, uh, yeah, and then and sort of not engineer mindset, but just um, some of these places are built for throughput, built for development. And there's loads of opportunities there for architects to get in. And, and again, like you say, even now, Fosters does team up with engineering on bridges, on, you know, airports, obviously, which is maybe a bit contentious, but the um, all large industrial complexes are still needed more than ever. Yes, yeah. the flow of tra- trade is going, you know, berserk. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about kind of the actual art of selling and negotiating and making sure that the fees are are kind of are, are set well. And also, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier just about this idea of confidence. And you know, mm-hmm. obviously, we look at someone like Norman Foster and and Thomas Heatherwick, and they're yeah, you know, they're they're quite enigmatic figures in themselves and i've heard the rumor of um norman foster in the past where you know, obviously we know his kind of the the drawing style at foster's you know is very kind of iconic and you know narinda sagu's sort of um way of developing that i've heard that uh i heard this wonderful story of of you know, it was a plane ride or something going off to a client pitch and norman foster sat and he rehearsed the drawing that he was going to draw live inside of the client pitch. And it was, you know, to kind of orchestrate a conversation was, you know, kind of like, oh, I've got an idea. And then he sits, stands there and does this, this live drawing. I don't know how much, how much truth is in that, but I like the, uh, the showmanship of it and the, the sort of ro- romance about it. How, how much, you know, kind of what, what's involved in the selling and negotiating process with, with a client? Because obviously it's actually, you know, you're dealing with teams of people. It's not necessarily mm. one person and another person. How, how do, what, what, what kind of mechanics are involved in these kinds of agreements that, that get made and, sure. and what sorts of negotiations, what does it look like? I mean, I think that's fascinating, that, that way of looking at things. And actually, if you don't plan before, the pitch or the when you're coming to see the client you you don't always perform very well really mm-hmm. and you come across as a bit bumbling casual and unorganized which doesn't help anyone especially a top ceo who's very busy and you've got 15 minutes to make an impression mm-hmm. if that um so i think planning is clearly really really important i mean i i and i think this works for for anyone in terms of we get a bit obsessed with, oh, architects don't like selling, architects don't like marketing, architects don't like business development, and it's disgusting words, and no. But I think there is a, there, there's a different, you can position your team to their strengths as well. And I think um, one thing of not obsessing about those terms, but focusing on partnerships and building partnerships, I think it's really important. And the fundamentally, we're trying to build relationships with people. Uh, in terms of selling, in terms of building trust with the some person on the opposite side who you may or may not have known for a while, how mm-hmm. quickly you can get to that trust situation so they buy with you, I think is fascinating. Thomas would often say they need seven touches before you really will will buy you buy something from you, which I think you hear time and time again in various other business books. Mm-hmm. I think um, I, I wrote down. It, keep, it ended up with P's for some reason, but partnership was one. 
then there was like problems and challenge and i think problems is interesting if you listen or read donald miller's written, written some amazing books including story brand yeah but he he positions things of understand what the client's problems are what are their pain points why would they you know position it like that i think some people don't care if you're 75 years of practice some people don't care it's about how are you going to solve my problem now and it could be the individual here or their team and often so i think if you position yourself to be i can solve that problem it's not even architecture in some ways it's like i am that trusted person who can build a team to solve that problem whatever it is specifically and we've identified it first mm -hmm. and then we break it down into its component parts really clearly um and then you start building out obviously the brief for the project and the purpose which is the third thing <laughs> strangely and then then this idea of practicing of uh doing it and refining it doing it better constantly learning constantly growing and then you get your portfolio which again was another p um but i couldn't do <laughs> it sounds really cheesy but then you get a portfolio which does matter but i think that that reinforces the wheel because then you get you go to the next meeting and you say well i've just been in this meeting solving these problems for this person he looks like you have exactly the same problems have you got are there any others there you know and, and we know how to solve those problems because here's the examples mm -hmm. you're not even talking about money yet but you're talking about problem solving and i feel that is the strongest position because and and something else i thought was quite nice where you position the client as the hero in this whole piece and you you're the guide again solving their problem you can be that wise not, not having a big beard but a gandalf type character or a uh, a guide not dumbledore but in terms of Harry's the hero, the client's the hero, he doesn't quite know what he's doing. He's got a big risk on his shoulders to try and sort out this problem or development, whatever. They're, and pushes, positioning it like that, they're in quite a nervous, stressful situation. Mm -hmm. They may lose their job if they don't deliver on time. The client may lose lots of money if they don't deliver. So recognizing that and then positioning yourself, you're not the hero, you're the guide, you can solve by giving them advice, you can solve their challenges because you've got this all this wisdom which you can help them with. And actually, that's really positive because I think often you turn in a sales situation, you can turn lots of people off if you come across as I'm this, I've done this, I'm amazing, blah blah blah. You know, and actually they go fuck off. You know, I, I want to do work with you. Often, the more mature, experienced, sophisticated clients will um, will know a lot of that. I think, and, and they almost can design the building, but they want something different as well. So this isn't a P, but I think admitting you don't know everything as well, and you're willing to learn and go on this journey with them, and it will be a pleasant journey. Mm -hmm. I think that's something, I think that's something Heatherwick do very well, is actually really nurture a client, really communicate very clearly, not in technical speak, but communicate really, sim not simply, but clearly to, CEOs very and then display the designs very simply. Mm -hmm. um, fosters as well, to be honest. There's a, there's definitely a sort of confidence in both camps. There's an ability to we can deliver this whatever it is. Believe in us. We believe in ourselves. And there's a can do attitude. Was something I was always really impressed with. Fosters very much. There was this drive to get stuff done. There was this ability to get stuff done. And the client was like maybe sometimes a bit disorganised. They they had this challenge. How do we get this over the line? Don't know. And, and actually often in the Middle East as well, some of the more recent experiences where fosters would actually be the ones driving the projects forward mm -hmm. and making sure the client um, was supported properly, especially if it was a startup client who had lots of new people in place or people who disappeared and new ones came in. They were the ones arguably who held a lot of the knowledge. Um, so, I think, so I think that's that's fascinating. And then it's a natural conversation to get into once you've crossed the line from you've built a relationship, you've built the trust step, you're then into a, a like, well, it makes complete sense to work with you because you're so helpful. Of course, I'm going to pay you. Of course, I want to work with you. They make my life easy mm -hmm. from the client's point of view. So I think if you can position yourself like that, it, it, it's then not necessarily clearly there's then they have to say they have to go to free clients or free, uh, free up, uh, different people to get procurement right. But I think if you're, you can justify your value then you can justify um well as i said at the start you can maybe try and secure a small small commission to really test it 
if you need more time to really build their um, their uh, full respect to you, if there's any questions you have or they have about you, but over delivering that first stage. And then it's just a no brainer to move to the next stage because yeah. by then you've probably defined the brief really clearly. And I think what's important is really showing that value of making sure the brief, the budget and the design vision are aligned by the end of stage two or concept design and, and holding the client to account. Say, well, you've got to sign that off and be quite firm with them in, in a nice way, but just saying for the project to be successful, we had even on the biggest scale, we had this, the design didn't, or the brief didn't match the budget, mm -hmm. which we both, you know, it was a real challenge because of big stakeholder groups because of, and how you rectify that, I think is a big discussion as well. And then the design vision will be what it will be, but that's products in some ways of what they want in the building, what they want, how much money they have. And you need to square, not square, but get the triangle to work together and be aligned. Mm -hmm. And then you can obviously move more into the production stages and delivery and get all the other team members involved, um, building the, the engineering complexity, building the, making sure it's costed and driven. But I think, so so that would be my approach, I think. And and then, yeah, just assessing if they're on the same journey, because some clients aren't. And I think they want just something good enough. And uh, is that enough? Is that, and then there's always constraints with budget, sometimes mm -hmm. very strict. So being realistic about that, getting that cost consulting involved quickly, early, sense checking if their budget's realistic, because often it can not be. The client did the budget three years ago, things have changed, we've gone up with the market changes, or it was just done badly. And that can cause huge stress on the projects and the project fails, not for your problem or the architects, uh, what hard work, it's because it, it isn't, hasn't been set up properly. And I think all those questions, again, you can be a guide in that sense and saying, well, this budget's not realistic. And, and I think two roles which work well is where you have this, either a project manager or design manager role, and then the design architect working side by side. And I see that can work quite nicely where the design leader partner can, can drive the design forward, keep a positive relationship. The partner is a sort of a design manager or project manager can push, um, push forward on the more commercial side, the project management stuff, the other, the wider team issues, like why aren't the engineers appointed? Why isn't the cost consultant on board? Why haven't you signed off these decisions? We've got all this information we need sorted out. We're waiting for, and that's holding us up. And and how you you can keep that sort of more process uh, project management uh, steps going, and then the architect can stay positive, have a really positive discussion with the client. You're still the same team, but mm. you um, you can split out the meetings. And often you have you know the client side. You can have a someone sign off the design vision, someone sign off the budget, and then someone delivering it, and then so you can mark different teams. Quite so, yeah, that. so interesting. So is that like, you know, you're dealing with multi-headed, multi-headed client teams here and actually, you know, your own team internally is kind of split up and to, to different parts, dealing with different parts of the, of the client at that scale. Um, That's right. with, 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 with your work now at Ridge and Partners, and you mentioned at the beginning of the, of, of the podcast, you know, um, some of the, you know, you're taking a different approach here because it's a, you know, you don't have the the same signature um, brand as a Foster's or Heatherwick, or you don't have it's not like a lead, it's not a star architect. What what sorts of approaches have you found that are that are different that you're using at Ridge and and partners and and that you know that are more sure. kind of innovative, if you like. I think it's a it's been a fascinating experience mm -hmm. because you can almost rewind to when you think when Foster's first started, when they didn't mm -hmm. have a brand, when they didn't have a name and just think, well, and track back to those projects, but over delivering and doing them, almost you come back to basics, you strip out the brand, you strip out that, you just focus on what makes a good project for that specific situation and do the best work you can. And I think that is where often there's, there's a bit of a gap because you can, you can draw, you can surprise the clients as well by over delivering, showing them something they weren't expecting. Um, use some of the tools and techniques you've gathered over the, from the bigger practices and what they might be doing, the lessons of what, what has been in a successful project. 
And um, but I think it comes down to also just being realistic that the budgets may be lower, the fees may be lower, but actually you can still deliver great projects. And and that piece I said about you know the f- breaking the project up, it seems to be quite common into mm-hmm. small steps and almost starting. And often, especially in the team in London, we're building a portfolio of work, and it's it's how that works. And Richard in certain sectors has is, has a really well developed name, such as in motorsports and various other areas. Right. So there's um a certain projects science and technology as well as well as um, higher education so you can dip into those experiences and i think it's a different offer in many cases because you're you're not just focusing on design you are focusing on delivery as well and and being and it's not the right for every client but you can show awareness to this multi-headed multidisciplinary approach and and offer in a way, a slightly different offer to people because it's not just focused on design, but it's saying, well, you'll get a really well-designed project, but it will be well project managed. It will also consider sustainability. It will consider all the specialisms because they could be talked to to Mm -hmm. bring into this project. So it's, again, I think it's de-risking the projects for clients. So, But then at the end of the day, if you can show some really nice projects as well, that's great. And I think that's what's coming through now. And time and time again, we're having clients saying those projects and those designs are really really great and um, they look good they deliver the brief and they they're hitting the budget so it's almost a win-win it's not really um well it's, it's an interesting challenge you've got to you've got to work within the constraints of the project and arguably those are those are better design challenges sometimes mm-hmm. and an unlimited budget um and i think uh the focus I wouldn't say it's easy. It's, it's definitely been difficult because you haven't got a constant stream of projects coming down. And I think that's something where a head work and the fosters are. There's a lot more work coming down the pipeline. Mm-hmm. But it's it's also satisfact, sat, satisfying by you're trying to generate the work, you're trying to build the relationships, and you're actually having um, more, in some ways more authentic conversations because, or, or more rewarding conversations because you've created that opportunity. And... Um, and then when you are delivering, it's a more personal situation. But I, th- I think still the the tools and the approach is f- exactly the same, really, in terms of really defining your your value. And like we touched on just now, how you go through that process, which is something which is fascinating. And I think constantly trying to communicate clearly, as I say, to raise the profile, because all companies change, which is changing massively, and it's going in a really positive direction and it's not the same company it was last year will be here before will be here before and it's it, it's almost we're constantly refining our collateral we're looking at different approaches learning and what's working what's successful what isn't successful we lost out for against hawkins brown recently which was actually a really good experience because mm-hmm. we're up talking to that you know in this in the same conversation and um that that's fascinating and that we took that as a major win Thinking mm-hmm. well, actually, we've 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 developed so honed our t- skills and tone skills for that specific opportunity. Now, what's next? Let's keep going, and there's a real momentum building. And I think that's for me, that's what gets exciting when you realise, even if you lose, you're winning because you're gaining, you're growing, and you're constantly refining it. I think what's been exciting for me as well is it's building this a uh, really exciting young team, especially in the London office. We've uh, I think it's 16 people at the moment, which is, is quite good. Some people have come across from Fosters actually. So there's a there's a common understanding of the design approach. There's but then there's there's younger architects and people associates who are coming up, assistants, and uh, there's focusing on that. What can we do as a startup practice in a larger practice is quite exciting. The different challenges you face. Um, and I've really enjoyed just helping the younger architects progress through as well and learn and grow and, and the sort of sharing knowledge from like we've talked about today and then thinking, well, what's what's right for us isn't right for a Fosters, but there's lots of things at Fosters which wasn't necessary. If we had full control, would we have done it like that? Maybe not. So uh, there's, a, there's an autonomy in a sense to the work we're doing now, which I think is really liberating um, and exciting in that sense, especially if you feel more, You've got more investment in the process, yeah. if that makes sense. And you're not a small cog in a big wheel. You're a, you know, you can help 
Yeah. The, the machine, machine work in different ways. But as I said at the start, I think it's not easy. I think the climate at the moment is difficult. The competition is very high. You've got to keep, always have built this resilience to keep going and mm -hmm. not get too emotionally attached if you fail. Because failing, you're obviously learning, you know, first attempts and learning and all that. And uh, I think it's, yeah, building that resilience that what we were focusing on last year was building the portfolio out. That's really helped us now when we're moving to the next year. And, and um, I think there's now a really positive momentum going. Um, and, and then that w looking out, as I said at the start, the mental health of the team and making sure they're not burning too hot and uh, they are taking breaks. When pressure's coming on, they're getting support. I think that side of team, the team dynamic is really important that you can, because you can't do everything clearly and how you split up the roles between you and um, do business development, but also delivery. And there's a um, partner I work with, Simon Mason came across from Foster's. He largely leads the design process and the quality. And then I'm more on business development and the commercial. So it's quite a balanced team. And as I said, that sort of project management, design management piece. So there's a balance there. And then under us, we've got a big sort of good support team of three senior associates who are very good, very, capable design but also really fascinated in winning more work and learning and then there's another sort of layer so it's quite well structured even though it's quite a small team mm. of, and i think we've got quite a lot of um uh resilience now already yeah. amazing amazing i i <laughs> I, I, th I think that's probably the, 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 a good place for us to conclude the conversation now i can see from we've you know i was just lost like i lost track of time now i was enjoying just in, listen, in absolute, absolutely brilliant, Andy. Really, so I really appreciate your your um, your time today um, uh, and sharing <clears throat> and sharing those insights and your and expertise. There's still loads more that I I want to ask. So um, maybe we'll have we'll have another one of these uh, uh, at a later date. But thank you so much for your for your time today. That was really really insightful. No problem. Enjoyed it. It was great. And that's a wrap. And one more thing, if you haven't already, please do head on over to iTunes or Spotify and leave us a review. We'd love to read your name out here on the show and we'd love to get your feedback and we'd love to hear what it is that you'd like to see more of and what you love about the show already. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment, and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, please follow the link in the information. Hello listeners, we hope you're enjoying our show. We love bringing you these insightful conversations, but we couldn't do it without the support of our amazing sponsors. If you're a business owner or know someone who would be an excellent fit for our audience, we'd love to hear from you. Partnering with us means your brand will reach over 40,000 engaged listeners each month. Interested in becoming a sponsor? Please send us an email at support at businessofarchitecture.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, pledge, warranty, contract bond or commitment except to help you be unstoppable.